Welcome everyone. My name is Twin. I am the program manager at Community Health Resource Center. We are hosting today's lecture brought to you by um, Sutter Health CPMC. And uh, in a moment, I will introduce our speaker. Before that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our organization, Community Health Resource Center. Uh, it's a nonprofit that's been around for over 30 years, and we have four main areas of service. We provide behavioral health services that includes mental health counseling. We provide nutrition, nutrition counseling with registered dietitians. We provide free community health screenings that include glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol in the community, and they're all free. So you're welcome to check out the links that I send at the end of this presentation, where you can find our schedule of free health screenings. And we also provide free health education in the form of special lectures led to you by healthcare providers. And um, if you'd like to support our nonprofit and the programs that we put forth, you can make sure you leave a feedback at the end of this lecture. Look out in your email. I send the feedback link directly to you. And you can also scan the image on the screen right now if you'd like to donate to us. So now introducing Dr. Milana Dolezal. She is a medical oncologist and she leads research that enables new approaches to the treatment of solid tumors and hematologic malignancies and cancer survivorship and supportive care. She is a principal investigator for National Cancer Institute and industry-sponsored cancer treatment, clinical trials across the Sutter Network and California Pacific Medical Center. She currently serves as Director of Cancer Survivorship and Supportive Services. All right, thank you so much. Let me uh, go ahead and, and get my screen up here so we can do the, the virtual thing. Um, well, thanks everybody. I appreciate you making time today. I do have a little bit of a disclaimer when I signed up for the talk. I didn't realize that uh, today was a kid's holiday from school. It's Indigenous Peoples Day. So hopefully there won't be lots of ruckus and that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm excited to talk to you today about topics of cancer survivorship. And I really like to think about it more in terms of cancer thrivership and really changes in the compassionate care that we deliver to our cancer thrivers. Um, so going through cancer and cancer therapy is a big deal. Um, and it's really not over after the more intensive part of your cancer treatment. Um, there is continual side effects from anti-estrogens, which will be one of the major focuses of this talk. And what's kind of new, your, what's your new baseline and how can we manage palliatively some of the symptoms you might be expecting? Um, and so that's kind of the, the overview today. Um, all right. So I always like to start with some introduction on the concept of cancer survivorship. What does that mean or cancer thrivership? Sorry, I'm going to probably continue to get emails throughout the talk. Uh, but at any rate, the health risks have changed and a lot of people will finish their primary treatment unaware of their risks and ill prepared to manage their future health care needs. And that is this from cancer patient to cancer survivor, this Institute of Medicine lost in transition that was published back in 2005. And this really outlined how after all of this bolus of, of intensive treatment, a lot of attention being paid to you, then all of a sudden now you're you know in this every six month or every four month type of follow-up. And that's after having uh, a lot more attention at the beginning. So the end of the treatment doesn't necessarily mean the end of the experience. As we know, there are more than 20 million cancer survivors in the USA now, and uh, really understanding their unique needs is imperative. Sometimes cancer survivorship can uh, have a sense of renewed life and purpose, maybe something in your life, a, you know, a relationship or a job that makes you redefine what's important to you, kind of like what we've been doing with this pandemic. Um, and long lasting effects of treatment might not be apparent right away. So I also like to set up this idea of the cancer control continuing, because uh, we are dealing with uh, a chronic disease in some cases and side effects from treatment that might need to be managed as a chronic disease. So, you know, we're familiar with prevention, early detection. I always make sure my breast cancer patients are up to date with their colonoscopies and other stuff that we can help with. 
And then we have this treatment phase that's pretty intense, depending on what stage of cancer you had. Um, and then survivorship is really about health promotion, uh, late effects management, surveillance, et cetera. So you guys are familiar with this. This is a, a busy slide uh, and you might be on a different spectrum. Um, just in general here, when we're talking about survivorship and I'll define that, uh, for the most part, these are curative patients with curative intent types of treatments. So that might be going to surgery first, then having radiation, then starting uh, anti-endocrine therapy, uh, perhaps an oncotype DX was ordered to understand if there would be a predictive benefit from chemotherapy for uh, early stage uh, estrogen and or progesterone positive type of cancer. Uh, and then you can see some of the other um, permutations here. If the oncotype was high, you might need chemotherapy prior to radiation. If the tumor was bigger, uh, especially triple negative or two positive, you often do neoadjuvant prior. So therapy prior to surgery. Uh, and that's sort of the gamut. So who guts what and when? Uh, again, if you're in this hormone receptor positive bucket, you will at some point end up with anti-estrogen focused therapies. So I'm gonna really focus on the top half here and also to point out that um, in terms of different drug types, sometimes we utilize ovarian suppression in younger patients that uh, makes younger patients who are premenopausal, postmenopausal with shots called Lupron. I'll talk a little bit about the soft and text trials and um, why we do that. So what does survivorship mean? So these are NCCN guidelines, uh, which are the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. What's the definition of survivorship here? And I've already sort of outlined that. It really starts with your diagnosis. With that being said, most of the focus is after the curative treatment, but we're doing a lot more personalized care these days based on tumor biology and even trans transforming uh, metastatic stage four cancer, often estrogen positive cancer can go to the bones uh, and even transforming that into a chronic disease. So what's the purpose of survivorship care? This is what you're looking at here. So recovery from treatment, side effects. And this also is not only with your oncologist but also in partnership with primary care. So this outlines here some of the early term side effects that can linger, whether it be fatigue, sleep changes, memory concentration. I'll talk a little bit about some strategies for not only chemo brain, but anti-estrogen brain, uh, lymphedema, neuropathy. I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, sexual dysfunction, weight gain, and then the late effects are often more than four, year, four to five years after cancer treatment. Um, and that can be bone loss, which we will address here in terms of um, some of the side effects of the aromatase inhibitors. And I, I really like this, this little uh, diagram here because it shows that it's really a multidisciplinary approach depending on what types of side effects you might be experiencing. And that includes psychosocial issues, sexual health, uh, and um, integrative medicine potentially as well. So it's really a team approach uh, also with your primary care. So specifically focusing on breast cancer treatment, uh, I'm going to talk about weight gain and hot flashes and fatigue, the joint aches that we get from some of the anti-estrogens sexual dysfunction, some bone thinning. Um, and these are sort of the gamut of things that patients might experience as a side effect from their therapies. So this just gives you an outline here. Again, this is our national comprehensive NCCN guidelines, uh, which are really robust these days. And you can see here on the left side, all of the survivorship concerns that are addressed, whether it be cognitive issues, anxiety, depression, fatigue, lymphedema, pain, sleep disorders, et cetera. So um, this is a nice resource. They, the NCCN also has patient-friendly types of guides uh, and it's free. All you need to do is just put in your email and a passcode and you can see some of these. 
But you can see, depending on what type of symptom we're discussing, there's a whole algorithm in terms of how to manage that. So what is anti-hormonal therapy, anti-estrogen type of treatment? Uh, this is a therapy used uh, for hormone receptors. So that could be estrogen or progesterone positive breast cancer. Remember there's three receptors on breast cancer cells that we pay attention to in terms of targeted therapies, personalized types of therapies. So there's estrogen and prog progesterone and HER2 are the three um, that we focus on. And so I'm gonna be focusing on the estrogen and of progesterone types of, of breast cancers here. So the therapies that we use for five to 10 years uh, block hormones and they can decrease uh, the body's production of hormones. In premenopausal women, generally we use tamoxifen because it focuses more on the ovarian, the ovary production of estrogen. Uh, and I alluded to earlier, um, the Lupron, which is a shot that makes premenopausal women postmenopausal with the use of aromatase inhibitors. And for postmenopausal women, we often use aromatase inhibitors. You guys hearing me okay? Perfect. Okay. I just saw some glitchy stuff. Okay, so I mentioned five to 10 years, we'll talk about some molecular platforms that can help with that decision. And really the goal is to decrease the risk for hormone receptor cancer returning. And sometimes it's, it can also be used prior to surgery to help shrink uh, tumors as well, um, in addition to after surgery and after radiation. Okay. So just a little bit of an outline, I mentioned tamoxifen is more often used in premenopausal women, uh, binding to the estrogen and the estrogen receptor. So you can't then have cancer signaling. And the other class of drugs that we use are aromatase inhibitors. They're listed there, anastrozole, arimidex, letrozole, extramustine, femora, they have different names sometimes. Uh, and they work by inhibiting the peripheral conversion uh, into estrogen. So aromatase is an enzyme that basically throws a ring on cholesterol as a building block of all the hormones, and then it produces estrogen that way. So these pills that you take block that from happening. And you can see the mechanism of action here. So I did talk a little bit about the approaches in pre versus postmenopausal women. You guys might be familiar with the soft or text trials that looked at the addition in younger women of a shot and then uh, an aromatase inhibitor. And that was based on this particular trial, um, the soft and the text trials. All right, so let's focus more on symptom management here. So what are some of the side effects of anti-estrogen or progesterone therapy, anti-hormonal therapy? So there's a lot, right? This is sort of the whole list here of night sweats, hot flashes, maybe not sleeping well because of night sweats and hot flashes, fatigue, cognitive changes, mood swings, depression, anxiety, sexual changes, decreased desire, libido. Uh, and then a lot of other things related to joints, joint bone loss, joint aches, muscle aches, myalgias, neuropathy, skin changes, hair thinning, etc. So why do patients gain weight? Premature uh, menopause can decrease the metabolic rate. Fatigue after primary treatment can uh, make people just feel like they don't wanna get out of bed or go take the dog for a walk or these things can uh, contribute to weight gain. Uh, similarly, continuing side effects of the joint aches, et cetera, stiffness, mobility issues can really um, be difficult. And then there are also potential late consequences. So I really like this quote here. Uh, I am a woman, I'm, an invin I'm invincible, I am tired. Uh, I think we all feel pretty tired due to the fatigue of the pandemic as well. So fatigue is the number one complaint. Uh, cancer related fatigue can be the most frequent and disturbing complaint of people with cancer. It can affect daily activities of living, even your productivity at work. But fatigue can be managed 
And I gave a, a talk a few weeks ago or back in August about um, exercise. I'm a big component of exercise. Our guidelines recommend at least 150 minutes of cardiac exercise a week. Now that could be walking five times a week for 30 minutes. Also good weight bearing for your, your bones. And about 30% of women on an aromatase inhibitor complain of fatigue. Uh, it's also important to address some of the underlying issues. Is it lack of sleep? Are there thyroid issues, depression, maybe uh, nutritional abnormalities, et cetera. And this is just a summary here showing that about 16 trials. Hi. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Dolezal. Okay. Um, we have a request from the audience. If you could slow down a tad bit, it's a little bit hard to follow along because you're talking a bit fast. Okay. All right. Thank I you. do that sometimes. Thank you for uh, monitoring the chat. Uh, okay. So let's slow down. Um, at any rate, so in terms of fatigue being a number one complaint, uh, exercise can, can really help with that. And this is just a kind of a meta-analysis, a meta-analysis that looks at a lot of different studies. Okay. So just to summarize a little bit, I'm not gonna go super deep into all the data here, but you can see that there are a lot of different clinical trials with over 2000 women. They had different interventions in terms of anaerobic, which is more burst or aerobic uh, exercises and resistance training. It's really trying to get your heart rate up and working on bone strength and these are some of the endpoints they looked at in terms of quality of life, cognitive function, et cetera. And we know that the aromatase inhibitors really can uh, cause joint aches. Most common reason for patients to discontinue their pills. Um, it may improve over time. Sometimes I do what's called cycling between the different uh, aromatase inhibitors to see if the side effect profile might be a little bit different if we try a different one. And there's quite a few interventions there and I'll go deeper into, into those. This was another study that looked at 150 minutes of exercise a week versus not. They had different types of metrics in terms of uh, this DASH questionnaire, specifically looking at pain and quality of life. And they had a combination of uh, resistance training or not. And you can see here that over a year in these breast cancer patients that were taking aromatase inhibitors, that compared to the controls of yellow, everything is positive. So they're having pain versus the severity and um, interference with their daily life and the purple exercisers, you could see it improved. It became more negative, i.e. less of an issue, not a negative connotation. These patients felt better. So this is just looking at walking. So this was a six week uh, self-directed walking program, 62 patients with curative stage breast cancer walking intervention or not, they had to be on a aromatase inhibitor for at least a month. And they baseline were exercising less than 150 minutes per week. Oh, not sure what happened there. Um, okay, there we go, later. Um, so a lot of these patients have had a higher body mass index. So obesity is defined as a body mass index of 30 or above, 27 is starting to get in the higher rate. So that's a measurement of um, obesity based on weight and height. And the bottom line is at six weeks, the intervention group that did the walking had less difficulty with ADLs, which is activities of daily living. So that's doing your laundry, going up the stairs, and less perceived helplessness, helplessness in terms of the joint symptoms. So really bottom line, and um, I'll say this again, is exercise, even though it's hard to get out of the house and do stuff, is helpful. Well, what if you can't walk? What if you really have mobility issues? Possibly you're overweight or you have knee pain, or maybe you've had knee surgeries or gonna get knee surgeries. 
So this is, is some data looking at doing aquatic exercises in a pool. And these were, again, curative stage breast cancer patients uh, who uh, did uh, pool exercises for two months, 24 session, three days a week. You can see the breakdown there in terms of the warm up and how much recovery time. And the bottom line is they adhere to the program and, and the patients felt decreased pain at certain pressure points in the neck and hands and shoulders and legs. They also had some decrease in their waist, weight circumference. Um, didn't seem to lose much weight, perhaps because the heart rate wasn't getting up as much in the pool, but patients felt better and that's what's important as well. So how do we cope with bone pains and bone loss? So one of the side effects of the anti-estrogens aromatase inhibitors can be osteopenia or osteoporosis. That means bone thinning. So if you're on these agents, you're probably getting a bone density scan about every two years. And you might already be on an intervention, i.e. A, a medication to help that. So on the left side here, I talked about exercise. So weight bearing exercise, ideally to build bone strength. So if you can do, if you're able and have the mobility to do sort of fast walking or a little jog for 10 seconds, then walk, that's at least two times your body weight. You can uh, run or walk with these heavy hand things. You can put them on and just sort of walk with them. Um, there's bone building vitamins, calcium, you wanna do less than a thousand in a day. Um, and vitamin D, usually about 1,000 to 2,000 international units. And I do measure those levels laboratory-wise, usually at least once or twice a year. Diet changes we've talked about. There is some data out there in terms of anti-inflammatory diets, so not a lot of processed foods. Um, there is a diet called the plant paradox. Uh, curcumin is, is what uh, is in curry, and um, that has been um, shown to have some anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And there's other types of holistic treatments out there, including glucosamine, chondroitin for joint support. Uh, what about pharmaceutical uh, drug options? So extra strength Tylenol. And this is not only for when you have pain, but really harnessing that anti-inflammatory effect. So it's taking Tylenol, basically the extra strength 500 milligrams about three times a day preventatively. Uh, so you don't get pain um, in terms of other bone strengthening agents. So a relative of tamoxifen is Avista raloxifen that does help build bone. There's shots called uh, Prolia or Denosumab, which you give every six months. And then in terms of other bone strength building drugs, there's bisphosphonates, and those are either a monthly pill or the old school Lendronate Fosamax, which is a weekly pill, or even reclassed IV, which is uh, once a year. What are some of the other side effects? Um, well, lymphedema can happen in patients um, that have had lymph nodes involved. Typically it's underneath the arms in breast cancer patients if you had uh, lymph nodes that were removed. Um, and it is treatable. So again, here's just a study from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm not gonna go into great detail, but it actually looks at weightlifting and resistance training in terms of helping with lymphedema and it can decrease the limb um, wideness. Uh, so it's basically a swelling of the, of the arm. And there are a lot of other lymphedema specific types of strategies uh, either, either with physical therapy, compression, we have a whole lymphedema clinic um, and there's other uh, options available there. What about those hot flashes that then can contribute to not sleeping so well? Uh, so I'm gonna talk about some of the 
drug interventions, whether it be blood pressure medications, nerve medications, even incontinence medications, antidepressants. And sometimes it's really just tailored to the patient in terms of what other side effects they might be experiencing. So if there's some baseline neuropathy, possibly from chemotherapy, then a nerve medication like Neurontin or Gabipentin might be helpful. Uh, we do use a Fexor, and I'm gonna show you some data. Um, that can definitely help with the severity of hot flashes and sometimes the frequency. I do wanna point out that other kinds of antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications in particular, there are some concerns about any drug-drug interactions, for example, with tamoxifen. Not as much of an issue with the aromatase inhibitors. Well, what about non-drug methods? You know, you're already taking a drug and now you have to take more drugs to combat the side effects of that drug, which never feels good. Uh, so other things could be chillo pillow. This is something that you buy on Amazon. It's just an icy pillow that you can put in your bed and then hug it if you're having a hot flash. Bamboo sheets is another uh, options. Uh, herbal options. And so I have some disclosures there. I am, I am not a integrative medicine doctor, um, but there are options available. I do uh, want to bring attention to the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, treatment website that does talk about a lot of different herbs and what they can be used for and are there any drug-drug interaction concerns, et cetera. So evening primrose can be used for hot flashes, as can black uh, cohash. The one caution I just say is twofold. One is just be careful. You don't want to go and get um, plant estrogen, uh, high, high, high doses of soy. I'm not talking about soy milk or tofu. I'm talking about pills that you get which might actually be plant estrogen, soy based that could help with the hot flashes, but that would not be recommended if you have an estrogen positive breast cancer. So be careful there. Uh, and then definitely discuss these uh, options with your oncologist and your treatment team, um, because we don't necessarily know how do these drugs interfere with your anti-estrogens in terms of these drug drug interactions. They're not regulated or studied by the FDA. Well, what about diet changes in terms of hot flashes? You know, really be careful uh, for alcohol intake at night. It can, uh, alcohol can be just like grape juice or orange juice, high sugar content. So it can spike your blood sugar. But then what happens is at about two or three o'clock in the morning after that glass of wine or two with dinner, then your blood sugar really drops and that can give you kind of cold sweats and um, hot flashes as well. Uh, one way to also mitigate sort of the drop in blood sugar is um, to take a tablespoon of peanut butter uh, before you go to bed and that fat can kind of help get you through the night and regulate your blood sugar smoothly. Um, so those are things to think about. Uh, if you're going to have that glass of wine, then have it with a really good piece of cheese, like a fatty brie or something else. Hopefully it won't give you abdominal bloating. Uh, there are also sleep aids out there. So melatonin um, is one uh, to think about. Generally, I recommend starting at about one or two milligrams. They come in gummies, so you can split them in half. half. They can give you pretty vivid dreams. So be mindful of that. Some people might have a little hangover in the morning. Paradoxically, if you go too high, you might actually um, stay awake. Uh, and then the other great one, uh, which comes in uh, a lot of different over-the-counter supplements like Calm, is magnesium. And uh, magnesium, about 250 to 500 milligrams, uh, that can really help with sleep. It also does keep your stool soft. So just be mindful of that. So if you take magnesium after dinner, then you'll probably get up and um, go to the bathroom number two. Uh, so if you have diarrhea, one of the reasons might be because of the magnesium. So keep that in mind. And I really like the Memorial Sloan Kettering website in terms of getting, giving more information about sort of holistic types of therapies. 
So I mentioned Effexor venoflaxine, which is a drug that we've been using for at least a decade now to help treat hot flashes. Uh, really, you just need to start at the lowest dose, which is uh, the 37.5. I recommend patients take it at night or play around with what, what time of day, depending on when the hot flashes are the worst. Are they keeping you up at night or are they having you uh, take breaks from work where you have to go you know, stand in front of the fan? All right, so you can see all of the uh, treatments for hot flashes out that are out there. These again are NCCN guidelines. I mentioned uh, venoflaxine, but I usually start at 37.5 or even a lower dose and then sort of work my way up. They talk here about 25. It is also an antidepressant. So if that's another issue, then it's a little bit of a two for one in terms of working with a therapist on um, antidepressant uh, medications. Um, and then uh, again, I caution in terms of some of the SSRIs, including Paxil, uh, in terms of drug-drug interactions with tamoxifen, keeping that in mind. I already mentioned Neurontin, gabapentin, if there's also some neuropathy, and that can definitely make you sleepy. I usually recommend uh, 600 milligrams, so two 300s at night, uh, and then just really making sure that you start it on a weekend, like a Friday night or Saturday night, where you don't have to get up in the morning and go driving because some patients can be really sensitive. Uh, and then clonidine is an anti-blood pressure medicine that's an older one. I don't use it as much anymore. And then I did wanna shout out some newer uh, uh, drugs on this list. So ditropan oxybutin was um, presented by Roberto at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference uh, almost three years ago now. And that actually helps quite a bit with hot flashes. It is also an incontinence medication for uh, bladder spasms. Uh, so that can also be a two for one if you're experiencing some stress incontinence when you sneeze or any of us who've had children know what that's all about, wink, wink. Uh, at any rate, so that can be another um, method to, to treat hot flashes. Okay, and then this is just a nice uh, summary of a lot of those different treatments. This is from ONS, the Oncology Nursing Society. And it's a really nice review that sort of talks about all these different agents I just uh, gave you a high level overview for, but certainly you can discuss this with your uh, care team. Well, what about incontinence? We mentioned that. So I just talked about ditropan as an option. So it can either be 2.5 milligrams or five milligrams, usually twice a day, can give you a dry mouth at the beginning for at least the first two weeks. So that can be uncomfortable. Uh, there's a lot of other options in terms of specific pelvic floor work. Uh, so again, any of us who've had kids probably remember Kegel exercises, a little fancier than that. Uh, but there's physical therapists that do specialize uh, in pelvic floor strengthening. There's training devices, neurofeedback, et cetera. Um, a lot of times some of the issues in terms of the uh, genital urinary, so it's more bladder urinary tract infections can also be related to vaginal dryness from lack of estrogen down there. And uh, I'll go a little bit more into this, but some of the options can be um, lubrication. So that can be coconut oil, external replens applicators, pre-seed, um, and uh, there's other CBD preparations like Quim. They have one called Oh Yes that also uh, can help with libido, which can be another issue on anti-estrogens, just not only having um, frequent urinary infections or painful sex, but also not even feeling like you want to have sex. Uh, and then there's also localized hormonal therapy that we'll talk about as well. So what about some of these sexual dysfunction symptoms? Uh, unfortunately, 40 to even 100% of cancer survivors have some for form of sexual dysfunction. So that could be painful intercourse, that could be vaginal dryness, and, you know, I already alluded to libido, in, uh, lack of libido, uh, difficulty with arousal, possibly orgasms. 
Um, and even compared to taking tamoxifen, some patients on AIs who are more postmenopausal at this point, higher rates of decreased uh, sexual interest, lubrication issues, et cetera. So I always say there's no stupid question and uh, see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil. Uh, so it's fair game. You know, I like to have an open communication with patients. And so sometimes I'll just ask, you know, how's your sex life going? Or are you having any problems? Or how's your relationship? And, you know, uh, the, the male partner often, if it is a male partner, it might get squirmy at this point, or then they open the conversation doors. So either way, ask your providers about these. So what is GSM? It's genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Uh, it's vaginal dryness, pain with in intercourse, sometimes even might manifest as frequent urinary tract infections. What can you do about it? So there's non-estrogen type of moisturizer. So that cuts coconut oil, replens, uh, pre-seed. I usually recommend about 30 minutes prior to sex. These are applicators. Um, if you are not spontaneous and plan things, uh, Quim, I alluded to. Uh, and then in terms of other types of uh, estrogen containing products that are local, these are listed here. So there's Vagifem, E-String, um, DHEA, I'll talk about Invexi in a minute, which is very low dose estrogen. And then there's the Mona Lisa touch laser. You know, I, it's expensive. Um, I have sort of mixed feelings about it in terms of its efficacy, but if it works for you, that's great. So what are some of the knowns and unknowns in terms of using topical local types of estrogens uh, in the vaginal area or canal? So some of the knowns are, this is a quality of life issue. Uh, we know that the estradiol levels, which is a measurement of estrogen in the bloodstream, can be really variable. And it's really hard to measure. There's some ultra sensitive tests, but they can, it's not reliable. Uh, so just keeping that in mind. Um, there can be sporadic elevations, uh, but we don't really know what all these transient elevations mean. If you started to take a product and your hot flashes stopped, i.e. a local product, well, that would be a concern. Why? Because that means that you're getting systemic uptake into your bloodstream that's stopping your hot flashes. But to be clear, these methods are local and really trying to deal with quality of life issues in terms of side effects of anti-estrogens. So where did this controversy start? I'm not going to spend a lot on time on this, but I just want to be clear that the Mitch Dowsett study, this is a UK study, looking at Vagifem, which is a local anti uh, local estrogen treatment in the vaginal canal, there's only six patients. And looking at the serum E2 is an estradiol measurement. You can see that there was elevations baseline and they were sporadic. And bottom line is we don't know what it means, but I am not concerned in terms of increasing your breast cancer risk. So we talked a little bit about GSM already. These are a lot of the symptoms that you can have. And um, one of the goals, uh, this was a clinical trial I was trying to pilot, was looking at non-estrogen containing versus estrogen containing types of products. And Invexi actually comes in very low dose types of um, estrogen strengths. These are vaginal inserts that generally you put in about two times a week for the first two weeks, and then it can even be uh, weekly. And I often collaborate with the gynecologist on this, and there are certain gynecologists, um, kind of like Dr. Ruth, if anybody remembers who she was, uh, that are really open to having conversations about um, sexual dysfunction and kind trying to come up with solutions. So it's not, See no, hear no evil. This is trying to work together on, on a quality of life issue that is really important to relationships and feeling good about yourself. What about cognitive changes? So certainly there's something called chemo brain. It's real, it's hard to quantify or qualify. Uh, can be changes in memory. 
Um, now, not everybody has these changes and even postmenopausal women or postmenopausal women on anti-estrogens or women on anti-estrogens can have some of these sort of short-term, uh, why did I come downstairs? What was I supposed to get? Um, so it's really important to exercise your, your brain just like you do your body. And so that means Sudoku, crossword puzzles, uh, really staying organized, calendars, writing things down. And uh, this is a, a group that does a neurofeedback um, called Superbrain. I have recommended it to some patients. Um, so, you know, other options to try and see if they help. Um, there used to be a clinical trial over at Samuel Merritt that was looking at this. So just, you know, doing your own research, these are some tools that are available. Uh, fortunately, insurance doesn't cover a lot of this kind of ancillary stuff, uh, but what can you do to sort of help your situation? So I just wanna segue a little bit too in terms of why do we have to take these drugs anyway? And what about compliance? And what else is new out there in terms of trying to tailor your treatment and how long do you need to be on these drugs? So one issue is in estrogen or progesterone positive patients, the, the cancer can come back uh, years later. And you can see here that even in terms of an early stage breast cancer, um, that even at 20 years, there can be up to a 13% risk of the cancer coming back. The more lymph nodes you have, if that have been positive, then you're at higher risk. Um, and so one issue is all of these side effects can lead to non-compliance, uh, meaning you don't wanna take that pill because it makes you feel horrible. And why, why bother? And you can see on the left here, you know, why did people discontinue the anti-hormonal side effects, worried about risks, wasn't sure that it was helping or not. Uh, maybe they move, maybe the insurance changed, um, but we prescribed these for a reason. And it would be nice to be able to tailor, you know, who needs, um, who needs an anti-estrogen for longer or not. You might've heard on the literature that in terms of tamoxifen, there's trials out there that looked at 10 years versus five years. Um, and, uh, in the aromatase inhibitor world, there's a NSABP trial that looked at seven years. So there is another tool that I use uh, and it's called the breast cancer index. And it goes back to the surgical specimen from five years prior when you're at that five year milestone of taking an anti-estrogen to understand if there's a predictive benefit of taking the drug for longer than five years. And so it's really clear in terms of whether or not um, your breast cancer was at risk for uh, a later recurrence, for example. And this particular uh, gene test that has about 11 different genes can help with that conversation as to whether or not you need to take the drug for longer or even help get you to a finish line of five years. It can be ordered as soon as three years into the diagnosis. And this is just an idea of what the test report looks like. So you can ask your oncologist maybe when you're four or five years into your anti-estrogen treatment, you know, could I get this test done? Um, all of those specimens should be archived in pathology and it is covered by Medicare and a lot of commercial insurances as well. So it's an important conversation to op up, open up. This is different than the Oncotype DX test that you might've had at diagnosis that was more of a chemotherapy, no chemotherapy kind of question. Well, what else is newer in hormone receptor positive breast cancer? Um, so there's a different class of, of drugs called CDK inhibitors. Uh, that really work on how cancer cells signal and grow and um, inhibiting uh, DNA signaling and cell cycle. This is a cell cycle here. Uh, G1, S phase, which is the DNA copy. Uh, this is back to biology. 
But these are drugs that we use clinically now uh, for stage four cancer that's gone to the bones. Uh, typically we do an anti-estrogen like letrozole or Arimidex and add one of these CDK inhibitors. There's three of them out there that are listed up high. So a benemcyclib is verizinio, palbocyclib, ribocyclib. And these have been well studied in the stage four setting. Uh, more recently for higher risk, early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancers that have at least four or more lymph nodes, there was this Monarch E study um, that looked at patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative early breast cancer that had a higher risk of recurrence and specifically looked at the addition of a particular CDK inhibitor, inhibitor abemacyclib, so one of these cell cycle blockers, along with another pill, your anti-estrogen pill. And it showed that there was uh, a benefit. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here because this is not yet FDA approved, uh, but for certain patients who have at least four or, or more positive lymph nodes, that might be a treatment option. So stay tuned. This was presented at our uh, oncology ASCO meeting in June of 2021. And this is a lot of words here. I just wanna make sure that um, you guys are up to date on what else is out there. If you hear headlines and wonder, is that something that might be applicable to me? So I just wanted to talk a little bit too about kind of the, the skeleton in the cloth closet in terms of fear of recurrence. Is it cancer? You might've had a radiation buddy or a chemo buddy or somebody in your support group that recurred. Um, want to make sure that socio-emotional care and support is also addressed. It's certainly unmet need in terms of side effects and symptoms, um, but sometimes it's not really discussed in a visit. This was some data um, that I presented a while ago at a uh, cancer survivorship symposium, looking at what are some of the biggest stressors and distress screening for cancer patients. And these were predominantly women and breast cancer survivors. And so the biggest bucket was actually non-physical concerns. It wasn't dry mouth or sleep or hot flashes. It was emotional and practical and you know, I lost my job or I lost my insurance or these sorts of things. And you can see here in terms of the interventions for patients who had a high distress screening of at least five, a lot of it was psychosocial referrals, support groups, some nutrition, some psychiatry referrals, et cetera. So that was the breakdown of the non-physical concerns. And because there was sort of a robust supportive services um, infrastructure, the distress screening overall was a little, a little less than we would have expected. Uh, at that time, I was working with the Lance Armstrong Foundation on a collaboration with a program called Cancer Transitions, which was a six week program addressing specific um, issues in the cancer survivorship community with uh, supportive care. So just wanted to point that out too. So really in terms of looking at that cancer care trajectory, you know, you have treatment with the tentus cure, we've got safer therapies. Some patients were not even using chemotherapy at all. Um, and then really working on the three Ps from one of my uh, role model mentors at UCLA, Patty Gans, palliation prevention and health promotion. So really it's about taking care of yourself, empowering yourself, being aware of short, medium, long-term side effects. How can you control intervene, working with your healthcare team to improve the quality of your life and your cancer thrivership. And again, I like to finish with this because it shows that it takes a village and a team in terms of all of the components that can help support you as a person. Okay, so that's most of um, what I wanted to discuss. Um, looks like we've got a whole bunch of questions and chats and, okay. Yes, so I, I compiled all of the questions into the Q&A. Okay. 
questions that were submitted during the registration and questions that were typed into the chat. I moved them all to the Q&A, but before we get to that, you have a, an old patient of yours from Berkeley's Comprehensive Cancer Center, and they, she just wanted to say- Oh, that's cute. This Hi. is really helpful. Oh, I appreciate that. I want to make an announcement that we have a ton of questions and not too many time. We usually have an hour and a half for our lectures, but uh, Dr. Dolezal will prioritize questions that are directly related to today's topic. And if she doesn't get to your question, I highly encourage you to check out the two best health, breast cancer related lectures we still have planned for later this October. One that's happening on the 20th, which is a panel and one is happening on the 25th featuring Dr. Dolezal again, and she will be doing a presentation on managing HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. Okay, so let's see. Um, we have, uh, what about muscle spasms, cramps? That can be a side effect of tamoxifen. Uh, also keeping in mind other things that could cause that. So it could be dehydration, it could be magnesium. Uh, so sometimes uh, making sure that you take Gatorade or Pedialyte before you go to bed, making sure you're well hydrated, watching alcohol, watching too much caffeine, because those are diuretics, which means you're going to pee out more than you drink in. Um, so sit dang well hydrated, but yes, it can be a side effect of tamoxifen. The other thing that can cause leg cramps uh, is either thyroid issues, so checking your TSH or T4 and low iron. So those are other things that can cause cramps. Um, Karen wants to know about chemo brain. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something to manage. And, you know, we've talked about that. Um, so neurofeedback, I mentioned the uh, program that's out of Albany, uh, Sudoku, crosswords, et cetera. Um, you know, as long as you're still on an anti-estrogen that can potentially persist as well. It's a little bit of a chicken or egg discussion in terms of, you know, what, what's contributing to what in terms of the past chemo, etc. Um, Pauline wants to know about neuropathy. Yeah. So, um, you guys in my office, you know, I have those little dog balls that are prickly that you can put your fingers over and roll over. Uh, it's like almost like acupuncture, uh, similar on the feet. You can rub your feet over them. Um, you can try uh, through the Institute of Health and Healing, uh, trying acupuncture or acupressure. Uh, those are um, modalities they have there. Again, unfortunately, insurance doesn't cover a lot of that. Um, so what about Motrin? Um, you can take Motrin. Um, again, I often recommend Tylenol in terms of extra strength. Tylenol doesn't have the same kind of GI side effects, whether it be uh, irritation of your stomach lining, et cetera. Um, in terms of the bone thinning, bone health, uh, that's a mix. You know, usually it's sort of stabilization. Uh, the medications I mentioned, in addition to weight bearing exercise, can help improve some, but you're probably not going to get back to the baseline where you were 10 years ago. Um, so what else here? Constipation gas. So it sounds like maybe seeing a GI doctor to help work through that. I mentioned magnesium, not only for cramps and sleep, but also keeping the stool soft. Uh, so taking magnesium after dinner or before you go to bed, that can be an option. Um, so I talked a lot about side effects, protect the bones. So that's uh, Avista, Riloxifen is an option in terms of um, some of the preventative, not only for breast cancer prevention, but also for bone protection. Um, I have talked a lot about that. Um, what else? Dry skin. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, eucerin, utter butter, things that are urea-based can help. Um, working with a dermatologist. I've had some patients even go on Retin-A for this kind of stuff. Um, 
Okay, and then I'm not familiar with the allergy research group. Um, so yeah, so again, I'm a medical oncologist. Um, I have interest in alternative therapies as well, but uh, I'm not somebody who's knowledgeable about all the permutations of that. Uh, and again, I would refer to the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, website in terms of uh, options there. Okay, um, best treatment for metastatic breast cancer of the bones and liver. Uh, so again, I mean, I mentioned the class of drugs called the CDK inhibitors. So generally speaking, uh, for bone only, metastatic hormone positive breast cancer, we recommend a CDK inhibitor and an anti-estrogen plus a bone agent, um, generally an Exgiva shot, which is once a month or Zomita IV. Uh, but it's best to talk to your oncologist about the treatment options that would be considered sort of standard of care. Uh, but it depends on the burden of disease in the liver and are the liver enzymes up. So goal with this was really more symptom management, supportive care. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think we are up on time here. Um, hopefully most of the other questions were addressed during this talk in terms of the insomnia and I didn't talk too much about peripheral neuropathy, but I mentioned the dog balls, Gabby, ben, Gabby Penton, Neurontin is another option. Uh, but again, all these pills that you take to combat the side effects of what you're on can be hard to, to manage sometimes. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Dolezal. That was a fantastic lecture. And I know we went really fast and I'm glad that you were able to slow down and fit in more information during that time. Thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions and your kind words. If you'd like to support our organization, Community Health Resource Center, we invite knowledgeable speakers like Dr. Dolezal out to share information and new advances in care. Um, you leaving your feedback lets us and our donors know that we are making an impact and that this information is appreciated. You can also support us directly by scanning that particular, there's a lot of QR codes nowadays. Um, I hope that we all are comfortable, but if not, I will send direct links uh, we connected to these QR codes in the post event email. And lastly, I also wanna mention that Community Health Resource Center also houses licensed, um, licensed providers who provide nutrition counseling and not just nutrition counseling, but medical nutrition counseling. So we work with cancer patients for disease prevention and management and along with weight management as well. And our mental health providers are licensed clinical social workers who do um, psychotherapy or um, short-term emotional support. Let us know. You can find out about us by scanning this QR code, or you can look out for any of the links that I send in today's post-event email.